Well, it's time for our whirlwind tour of art history. Such an impossible task that we're not even going to try to get everything. We'll just hit a few highlights. And I'm going to base this on the organization and the offerings of the Art Institute of Chicago. For many years in the regular sections of this course, there was a field trip to Chicago that included two or three hours at the Art Institute. So I've been there quite a number of times with classes sometimes as large as 80. And uh, it's one of the great art, in, art museums of the world, certainly one of the top ones in this country. And here is a little bit of their official introductory video, something you can get online on their website or on YouTube. And I've trimmed it down a bit. Instead of about six minutes, it's a little more than three minutes. Anyway, here it is. The Art Institute of Chicago is more than 130 years old, and it's Chicago's great civic art museum. The founders of the Art Institute of Chicago and those who succeeded them were dedicated to the idea that the Art Institute would be a great encyclopedic museum, representative of all the world's cultures, as well as a museum of modern art. The collection of the Art Institute of Chicago isn't just a collection of paintings and sculptures and works on paper drawings, prints, photographs, so much as it is a history of human imagination in visual form. The Art Institute of Chicago was founded in the late 19th century by a feisty group of wealthy Chicagoans who wanted to put a gritty working class city on the cultural map. The Art Institute was created to both educate the next generation of artists and to expose the citizens of Chicago to works of the masters. But the museum's founders were more than just civic boosters. Many also possessed an avant-garde spirit, collecting the latest and greatest works of art of their time. That vision led to one of the best Impressionist collections in the world outside of France, and continued throughout the 20th century as the museum grew. As important new works were collected, the breadth and depth of the collection expanded as well, with objects that represent the sweep of human history through 5,000 years of artistic expression. Now, at the beginning of the 21st century, the Art Institute of Chicago is one of the great encyclopedic art museums of the world. I think that an encyclopedic museum um, is trying to represent the whole globe under one roof. And all of the great cultures of the world, as well as what is happening uh, in these cultures today, in a contemporary sense, I think that is a very, very important purpose that the museum serves. It allows us to use our collection not just to teach European Western history, but to teach African, to teach uh, Asian art. So here you can come up and see a Monet that's inspired with a kind of Japanese composition and go downstairs and look at the prints that he would have seen. So I think the connections are all important. A global collection enables the, the public to have a global perspective on what the word art means. It tells the, the human story, human endeavors, uh, human religious beliefs, life and death at the other end and beyond. Founded for the citizens of Chicago, with eyes open to the wider world, the Art Institute of Chicago welcomes each and every person, whether they hail from across town or from across the globe. That dedication is reflected in architecture that embraces all visitors, programs that invite partnerships with diverse communities, and in exquisitely arranged exhibitions that showcase visual works from the world's many cultures. So that lets you see a little bit of what you'll be missing by not going to Chicago in person. Of course, you'll also be avoiding a $25, or for students, a $19 admission fee. Um, but what I have decided to do is, based on what they have available on their website, they have divided their art up into 15 categories. And I've taken 
the 10 most traditional of these categories. And I've taken two artworks for each one, and a couple, I've got added a third. And we're going to look at those in some detail. Not a lot of detail, I'm going to give each one about one minute. I think you can afford that much time. Um, national surveys have shown that visitors to art museums actually spend more like three to five seconds per artwork that they look at. And if you consider how many thousands of pieces there are there and how, especially toward the end of your visit, you start going past them quickly, that's probably pretty accurate. But we're going to give about a minute to each of these, and I will be reading some of the um, information about those that you could read either online or in the museum itself. And I've taken these, three, these 10 areas, and we'll just do them in alphabetical order. The very first one is African art. This is an altar head for an oba, or tribal chieftain. It comes from Nigeria around the 18th or 19th century. This commanding brass head served as the elaborate pedestal for a sculpted elephant tusk. It was commissioned by a newly enthroned Oba to stand on an altar commemorating a previous Oba, probably his father. The Oba of Benin rules by divine right and is the channel through which his deified royal ancestors vitalize and protect the kingdom. In Benin, the head is a prominent symbol that refers to a person's ability to move successfully through life and to become a productive ancestor. This head's high beaded collar and net-like cap depict an Oba's coral regalia. And here is a Mwanpuo mask from Angola or the People's Republic of the Congo from the late 19th century. Performed during initiation ceremonies for young men, this mask portrays Moana Po, an archetypal female ancestor, and symbolizes fecundity and the prominent role of women in a matrilinear society. Men wear such masks along with tightly fitting bodysuits of knotted fibers. A Moana Po mask may be inspired by a particular woman. Although this example is idealized, its naturalistic features suggest the individuality of a portrait. The breeded coiffure and lines of scarification on the chin and cheeks add to its beauty. The cross on the forehead may represent a scar or a pendant that is worn attached to the coiffure. I hope you did okay with that. There were some tough words, some odd uh, terminology in that, but that was just... Uh, the information that you'll have at the museum. Let's go on to our next category, which is American art. We're going to do three works here. So here is a little bit of American art. Albert Bierstadt was born in Germany, but he was basically an American painter. This is Mountain Brook from 1863. Albert Bierstadt is best remembered for his paintings of the American West, but during his early career, the ambitious artist also created New England landscapes, particularly of the White Mountains, as seen here. When this painting was first exhibited in 1863, critics declared it Bierstadt's best work and praised the artist's deft contrast of light and shade, which brought a heightened realism to the image. Bierstadt's affinity for the White Mountains mirrored a growing interest in the region as one of America's premier tourist attractions. Photographs of the area from the 19th century suggest that Bierstadt utilized landscape elements from the popular tourist site The Flume in this imaginary composition. And coming through the rye, this is a bronze sculpture by Frederick Remington. 1902. As Frederick Remington quickly mastered the art of bronze sculpting, he turned to increasingly complex compositions and tested the limits of casting techniques by freeing his figures from their bases. Coming through the rye displays four pistol-waving cowboys. Only six of the sixteen horse hooves touch the ground. 
Although the faces and gestures of the men are best seen from the front, the side view truly conveys the dynamic sense of motion, the stride of the animals, and the details of the clothing. And the very well-known American Gothic from 1930. This familiar image was exhibited publicly for the first time at the Art Institute of Chicago, winning a $300 prize and instant fame for Grant Wood. The impetus for the painting came while Wood was visiting the small town of Eldon in his native Iowa. There he spotted a little wood farmhouse with a single oversized window made in a style called Carpenter Gothic. I imagined American Gothic people with their faces stretched out long to go with the American Gothic house, he said. He used his sister and his dentist as models for a farmer and his daughter, dressing them as if they were tin types from my old family album. The highly detailed polished style and the rigid frontality of the two figures were inspired by Flemish Renaissance art, which Wood studied during his travels to Europe between 1920 and 1926. After returning to settle in Iowa, he became increasingly appreciative of Midwestern traditions and culture, which he celebrated in works such as this. American Gothic, often understood as a satirical comment on the Midwestern character, quickly became one of America's most famous paintings and is now firmly entrenched in the nation's popular culture. Yet Wood intended it to be a positive statement about rural American values, an image of reassurance at a time of great dislocation and disillusionment. The man and woman, in their solid and well-crafted world, with all their strengths and weaknesses, represent survivors. The third category is Ancient and Byzantine. Now that covers a lot of different cultures, but again, we're following the organization of the Chicago Art Institute, and it is worldwide, has a great collection, but not a vast amount in that area, so it makes up just one category for them. So here's two artworks from the Ancient and Byzantine. This is a fragment of a mosaic from the Byzantine Empire around the 5th century. This mosaic fragment was once part of a larger composition that paved the floor of a wealthy family villa in the eastern Mediterranean. Composed of thousands of small tesserae, or stone cubes, it shows a giraffe and a human handler standing against a decorative backdrop of scallop-shaped semicircles. No doubt originally set amid a profusion of other wild and exotic animals, giraffes such as this one captivated the imagination of those who saw them in parades and public games. Writing around the turn of the 3rd century, the historian Cassio Dio, about A.D. 150 to 235, among others, called this marvelous creature a camelopardus because, in his opinion, the giraffe combined the, the physical traits of both the camel and the leopard. And then a Greek coin depicting Alexander the Great from about 300 BC. As Alexander's army swept through the Persian Empire, the king established mints where he converted captured gold and silver into coinage bearing his portrait. Because they were dependable and could be used throughout Alexander's empire, these coins immediately established Alexander's authority. The use of realistic portraiture on coinage was copied by his successors. Unique to Alexander's image, however, is the ram's horn curling around his ear, which identifies him as the son of the god Zeus Ammon, a combination of the Greek god Zeus and the Egyptian god Ammon. By including the ram's horn, Alexander capitalized on the Egyptian tradition in which the pharaohs were thought to be gods on earth. And now, Asian art. Again, this could be vast because there's so much art that's been produced in China and other Asian countries, but we'll confine ourselves to two at about a minute each. This is bamboo-covered stream from the China Ming Dynasty in 1441. The painter himself, Xia Chang Zhongshao, wrote about this painting. 
Zhu Ji Hong of Hai Wu built a house at Zi Chu, where ten thousand long bamboo trees surround the stream. I love the quiet and beautiful scenery of stream and rocks, and the green and moist color of bamboo is enough to clean away worldly worries. One day, Ji Shong had his second son, Ting Yu, bring me a roll of blank paper and ask for a painting of bamboo. At that time, I was enjoying the coolness at the pine pavilion. Therefore, I thought about the scenery and painted the bamboo-bordered stream in spring rain. Although my painting cannot match the old master's essence of learning, it resembles the scenery of Zi Chu. And then, from India, 10th or 11th century, this is Shiva as Lord of the Dance. Shiva, one of the most important Hindu divinities, is here depicted as the Lord of the Dance, an iconic image in Indian art. Shiva's cosmic dance sets in motion the rhythm of life and death. It pervades the universe as symbolized by the ring of fire that is filled with the loose, snake-like locks of the god's hair. One pair of his arms balances the flame of destruction and the hand drum that beats the rhythm of life, while another performs symbolic gestures. The raised right hand means fear not, and the left hand, pointing down toward the raised left foot, signifies release from the ignorance that hinders realization of the ultimate reality. Shiva is shown perfectly balanced, with his right leg planted on the demon of darkness, stamping out ignorance. The tiny figure of the personified river goddess, goddess Ganga, is caught up in this matted flowing locks. Hindus believe that Shiva breaks the fall of the great Ganges River as it descends from the Himalayas by standing beneath the waters which divide over his hair, becoming the seven holy rivers of India. This classic bronze comes from the Kola period of the south of India. Icons such as this were carried in procession during religious ceremonies. And in our alphabetical listing, our next category is contemporary. Here are two works in the contemporary area. This is Grade Rainbow by Jackson Pollock, 1953. In the late 1940s, Jackson Pollock developed a revolutionary form of abstract expressionism by dripping, pouring, and splashing paint onto large-scale canvases. Emphasizing the expressive power of the artist's gestures, materials, and tools, Pollock often applied paint with sticks, trowels, and palette knives instead of brushes. With no apparent beginning or end, top or bottom, his works imply an extension of his art beyond the edges of the canvas. Among the last great purely abstract paintings Pollock made before his untimely death, and a quintessential example of action painting, Grade Rainbow is predominantly black, white, gray, and silver. In the bottom third of the canvas, however, the artist thinly concealed orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. The title presumably refers to these gray sections of hidden color. This is Parallel Manipulation by Christina Ramberg, 1977. Christina Ramberg is known for enigmatic paintings of fragments of the female body, typically torsos, legs, and hands, tightly cropped and partially clothed, bound, or veiled. The formal clarity, stylized figuration, and references to surrealism and popular culture in her works aligned her with the Chicago Imagists, who she exhibited with in the False Image exhibitions at the Hyde Park Art Center in the late 1960s. The artist's pointedly feminist critique of the social conditions that physically shape and constrict the female body was furthered by her interest in costume history and her collection of medical illustrations, paper dolls, and fashion advertisements. Her focus on patterning and clever use of juxtaposition are expressed in Parallel Manipulation, in which a head of braided hair mimics the decorative designs of a woman's garment. The offerings in European art are rich enough that it, there are two areas it's divided up into. One is European decorative art, and the next is European painting and sculpture. So first, a couple items in European decorative art. This is a center table, 
made in England about 1755. Imagine how impressive this table would have looked when fully extended and set with silver at the center of a large hall glowing with candlelight. Made in England in the mid-18th century, it has a hinged top so that it could be placed against a wall when not in use. The table is made of mahogany, which was imported to England from Central America and the West Indies. The dense and fine-grained nature of the wood made it suitable for carving in relief, as can be seen in the virtuoso carving of the table's frieze and legs. The legs have been shaped as ram's heads with scrolling horns in high relief and swags of vine suspended from their mouths. Like goats, rams were traditionally associated with Bacchus, the Roman god of wine, and thus revelry, indicating that the table was probably intended for a dining room or banquet room. And here is a tureen in the form of a rabbit, also from England and probably about the same year, 1755. For the rich and powerful in the 18th century, formal dinner was theater, and it was not uncommon to serve multiple courses, each of which could consist of dishes arranged on the table. Pieces like the rabbit tureen were an important part of the theatrical set decoration. The Chelsea por porcelain manufactory produced tureens not only in the shape of rabbits, but also vegetables and birds. Chelsea porcelain makers prided themselves on the realistic results of their craftsmanship, proclaiming in a sales catalog that they offered a fine tureen in the form of a rabbit as big as life and an oval dish. And here is European painting and sculpture. I've chosen three works here. Part of that is because the Art Institute is, has such a rich offering in that area, especially French. The Holy Family with St. Elizabeth and St. John by Peter Paul Rubens, 1615. By the early 17th century, the Flemish city of Antwerp had been a center of the trade in luxury objects for more than a hundred years. Peter Paul Rubens's workshop dominated the production of paintings there between 1608, when he returned from an extended period in Italy, and his death in 1640. A highly cultivated man as well as a masterful painter, Rubens was renowned for his ambitious religious and mythological works. Even his treatment of more intimate sacred objects, subjects, like the Holy Family, drew on the precedence of antiquity and the Renaissance. This pyramidal composition, formed by the movement of the infant Christ and his cousin St. John the Baptist, and anchored by the cradle, derives from the work of Raphael and his followers. And The Bedroom by Vincent van Gogh, 1889. Vincent van Gogh's three versions of this composition are the only record he made of the interior of the Yellow House, where he lived while he was in Arles, in the south of France. The house embodied the artist's dream of a studio of the south, a community of like-minded artists working in harmony to create art for the future. The first version of The Bedroom, Van Gogh Museum of Amsterdam, was one of the paintings Van Gogh made to decorate the house in anticipation of the arrival of his first guest, artist Paul Gauguin. Gauguin's stay at the Yellow House would be fraught with tension. After two months, Van Gogh's self-mutilation and Gauguin's flight back to Paris ended the studio of the South. Van Gogh made this second version of the bedroom about a year after the first, while he was living at an asylum in Saint-Rémy. And Adam by Auguste Rodin, 1881. Auguste Rodin's powerfully expressive figure of Adam was originally intended to be paired with a sculpture of Eve, flanking a sculptured bronze portal commissioned by the French government for a museum in Paris. For this monumental undertaking, which he entitled The Gates of Hell, Rodin turned to past Italian masters. Michelangelo's creation of Adam fresco on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome inspired the pose of Rodin's subject. Rodin rotated Michelangelo's reclining Adam and transferred the frescoed figure's gesture of receiving life from God to the sculpture's right arm. 
The exaggerated turn of Adam's left arm comes from Michelangelo's sculpture of the dead Christ in his Pietà. Rodin chose the portal theme from Dante's 14th century epic poem Inferno. Here, Adam's agonized body strikingly conveys the sufferings caused by original sin. And now a couple examples of Native American art, or American Indian art, or to use the terminology that the Art Institute uses, it is Indian art of the Americas. This is a portrait vessel of a ruler from the north coast of what is now Peru, sometime between the first century BC and about 500 AD. Before Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World, great Indian civilizations thrived in Central and South America, with the richest and most powerful centered in the modern nations of Mexico, Guatemala, and Peru. Between the 2nd century BC and the 7th century AD, the Moche culture of Peru produced a naturalistic ceramic art that included portraits of great individuality and expressive power. This portrait vessel depicts a forceful ruler. Such vessels were placed in graves along with others that portray aspects of the Moche universe. In this respect, they correspond to the tomb paintings found in other civilizations. And here is a hieroglyphic altar, a late Maya, around 650 to 700 AD. This altar depicts the head and torso of an individual wearing an ornate headdress and a large woven mat pectoral emblem of rulership. He appears with, within a four-lobed cartouche, suggesting that he is a deceased ancestor who lives in the underworld. The hieroglyphs that surround the figure describe the commemoration of a monument or structure. The text carved around the sides of the monument celebrate a successor's completion of six years of kingship. And now we'll look at two from the area of medieval and Renaissance art. This, of course, would be European. The Dream of St. Jerome from 1476. This panel formed part of the base of an altarpiece commissioned from Matteo di Giovanni by the Placidi family of 1476. Other parts of the altarpiece remain in the church of San Domenico, Siena. This small narrative panel honors St. Jerome as both a holy hermit and a learned father of the church. Even after he retreated to the wilderness, Jerome took pleasure in reading the literature of pagan Rome. This scene depicts his dream that he is called before a heavenly judge for choosing pagan authors over the Bible. The painting's impact is heightened by the combination of the expressive figures and intense color scheme with a rational architecture evoking the antique world that Jerome rejected. And a reliquary casket from France, 1200. Reliquaries were bones or possessions, objects of saints. This reliquary casket, with its vibrantly colored enamel fields, is typical of the objects created at the prolific workshops in and around Limoges, France, in the Middle Ages. By the end of the 12th century, Limoges' work had gained an international reputation, and documentary sources indicate that ornamentation with enamel was considered as precious as that with gemstones. Six figures of saints appear on the front panels of the casket, while a single saint is shown standing on each end panel. This decidedly non-specific iconography would have made the casket appropriate for any number of churches and allowed it to house the relics of virtually any saint. And now a couple examples of modern art. Now why they distinguish this from contemporary art, I'm not really sure, but that is the way they categorize these two works of modern art. Sky Above Clouds by Georgia O'Keeffe, 1965. Painted in the summer of 1965, when Georgia O'Keeffe was 77 years old, this monumental work culminates a series based on the artist's experiences as an airline passenger during the 1950s. 
Working in Abiquiu, New Mexico, O'Keefe began around 1963 to capture the endless expanses of clouds she had observed from airplane windows during trips all over the world. Beginning with a relatively realistic depiction of small white clouds on a three-by-four-foot canvas, she progressed to more stylized images of the motif on larger surfaces, ultimately extending her idea across a canvas that spanned the entire 24-foot width of her garage. Given its scale and the predominance of rounded shapes in the composition, Sky Above Clouds 4 has often been compared to Claude Monet's famous water lily murals. O'Keefe wrote, I painted a painting 8 feet high and 24 feet wide. It kept me working every minute from 6 a.m. till 8 or 9 at night as I had to be finished before it was cold. I worked in the garage and it had no heat. Such a size is, of course, ridiculous, but I had it in my head as something I wanted to do for a couple of years, so I finally got at it and had a fine time. And there it is. Not my best and not my worst. And A Spindle Cube Chair, Frank Lloyd Wright, about 1902. This elegant spindle cube chair is an early example from Frank Lloyd Wright's home and studio. In 1889, Wright built a house for his young family on Forest Avenue in Oak Park, a new suburb just west of Chicago. Ten years later, he opened an attached studio and designed it and the home's interior in accordance with his philosophy of simplicity and the integrity of materials. Among his furniture experiments were heavy, solid cube chairs. By the first decade of the 20th century, Wright had refined his earlier design into that of this chair, adding spindles, a subtly tapering crest rail, and gently curving leg ends to produce an effect that is equal parts sophistication and simplicity. The spindles themselves were a legacy of William Morris, inspired ladder back dining chairs, as well as the arts and crafts approach of contrasting positive and negative space. This chair was also influenced by the reticulated ceilings and walls of Japanese homes. Well, that's our whirlwind tour of world art history. Just 22 works that we covered. I tried to get as much variety as I could and also keep from going too long. So I'm trying to keep this video to a reasonable length. Anyway, I hope that you're now in the mood to give a try to doing some observing, some inspecting, some thinking and describing of artworks. So please read the assignment and there will be some graphic files for you to observe and to write on. Thank you.